This is the last session from the World Day of the Critical Lang. I guess it's also one, uh, one exciting session that we will have the opportunity to listen three really important and outstanding lectures. Firstly, firstly we will listen Dr. Chanu Rini. Secondly, we will listen Dr. Ferrer, Miguel Ferrer. Really, Dr. Miguel Ferrer is the second time that participate in the in this event, and it's a real honor for us. And um, finally, we will have the opportunity to listen my friend, colleague, and I guess one of the most relevant intensivists, Dr. Orville Baez who is from our hospital in Madrid. Then, Dr. Marcela González and Dr. Rosa Reina, the first from Madrid, the second from Buenos Aires, will make two or three questions. Well, Dr. Chanurrini, would you mind share your screen and start your lecture, please? Thank you for um, the opportunity to present. Um, again, I'm Dr. Ree from um, Harvard Medical School. I'm a transplant infectious disease physician as well as a medical intensivist at the Brigham Women's Hospital. So I will be talking about pneumonia in immunocompromised patients, particularly those with cancer. I will jump right in now. I have no conflicts of interest. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about epidemiology and pathogenesis, diagnosis and therapy. In terms of the epidemiology of pneumonia in cancer patients, it's a big problem. <clears throat> it's estimated to cause or complicate one in 10 hospital admissions among cancer patients, and more than a third of uh, patients with hematological malignancies will develop pneumonia at some time during their course of treatment. It's a common cause of death in this population and is independently associated with worse outcomes. And it's important to realize that these patients are at risk for um, opportunistic infections as well as drug-resistant pathogens, uh, largely because of the fact that they're getting repeated course of antibiotics and a lot of exposures to the healthcare system. This slide uh, summarizes uh, some of the reasons why cancer patients are particularly susceptible to pneumonia, uh, starting on the left side with extrapulmonary risk. So a lot of our cancer patients are already debilitated, they are in a catabolic state and malnourished. They also have epithelial bar barrier disruptions due to chemotherapy and mucositis, sometimes radiation or graft versus host disease. They are higher risk for oral gastric aspiration, sometimes due to mass lesions in their swallowing apparatus or CNS impairment or mucositis, or in some cases radiation or other um, types of tubes that they have um, already in place. Many of them have structural lung disease in terms of um, emphysema, bronchiectasis, or from prior radiation, um, and of course, they are also, many of them will also have um, tumors in the parenchyma that can compress the airways or within the lumens that can um, predispose to uh, post-obstructive pneumonia. And then looking at the airspace, um, at the airspaces, um, they are um, at risk for um, neutropenia, of course, as well as other immune deficits that can impair the host pathogen interactions. This slide summarizes the uh, epidemiology of pneumonia pathogens in cancer patients, and this is kind of summarized from a, a variety of different references, obviously just an estimate, but still the plurality of infections are from typical bacteria, although again, these, they're at higher risk for resistant organisms. They're 20% um, from mixed infections, 15% from viruses, and um, these patients are at risk, of course, for atypical organisms like uh, fungal organisms, uh, pneumocystis and nicardia, and mycobacteria, which are much more common than an immune population host. In terms of viral infections, um, the respiratory viruses like the flu, RSV, parainfluenza, adenovirus, and human metanumovirus are, of course, common in both immunocompromised and immunocompetent patients, but cause much more severe um, disease when the patients are immunocompromised. HSV and VZV are important causes of um, potential pneumonia as well. They can disseminate from the skin to the lungs and visceral organs or they can spread directly from the upper um, respiratory or oral pharyngeal tract into the lungs. And of course, pulmonary and disseminated infections are life-threatening emergencies. 
CMV is something that we often worry about, um, but really we were really worried about this in our lung transplant patients and perhaps to a slightly lower extent in the bone marrow transplant patients, not so much in our routine cancer patients that are just getting uh, routine chemotherapy. So pneumocystis is, um, occurs in patients who are on uh, high doses of, of glucocorticoids or have other defects in the cell mediated immunity and tends to be more common uh, in the patients with hematological malignancies than solid cancer. Um, and in the stem cell transplant population, the risk is pretty high without prophylaxis, and it can occur, occur at a median of about two months um, after transplant. Of course, patients on prophylaxis, the risk is going to be lower and, and typically occurs a lot later, although that also depends on whether they're being um, optimally prophylaxed with Bactrim versus something like a tovoquone, which is less effective and can present with both acute or subacute illnesses classically with uh, diffuse bilateral interstitial infiltrates. Astragalus is the most common mold infection, um, and patients are predisposed uh, if they are, have a prolapse or stem cell transplants, and often presents with fever on the antibiotics, and um, with or without um, respiratory symptoms like cough, chest pain, or hemoptysis. And the classic CT findings are ground glass opacity surrounding a pulmonary nodule, the so-called halo sign. And while pulmonary disease is the most common, you also have to look out for other manifestations like sinusitis, um, cutaneous disease, and disseminated infections. So, uh, you know, pneumonia is difficult to, to diagnose in, in a lot of patients, but um, in the sense that there are a lot of non-infectious mimickers, but this is particularly true in cancer patients. Uh, they are at high risk for having pulmonary edema. They can have tumor and lymphangetic um, spread to the lungs, the radiation pneumonitis, they can have interstitial lung disease or toxicities from their chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> they can get pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, pulmonary embolisms, of course, alone typically don't cause uh, radiographic abnormalities, but when they cause infarctions, they certainly can. Uh, cancer patients are commonly being transfused, so they're at risk for um, trolley. And uh, there are also specific um, syndromes um, in the bone marrow transplant population, like idiopathic pneumonia syndrome and engraftment syndrome to be aware of. In terms of diagnostic um, evaluation, a couple of general considerations. First is that uh, these patients are very complicated and um, they may not have only one thing going on. You can't necessarily anchor your diagnosis just on one entity. So they can have, for example, pneumocystis and CMV and pulmonary edema and drug toxicity. Um, <clears throat> and more so than in the immunocompetent patients, early imaging with a CT scan is important, as is a patient microbiological diet whenever possible. And that, that's to be, and sometimes even lung biopsies are often needed to make the diagnosis. And lastly, the laboratory assay results are not always very straightforward. They must be interpreted cautiously and in the context of each individual patient. So going back to CMV, just because you have a positive CMV doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going on, that's what's causing the patient's disease. Some uh, epidemiological clues to think about. Um, the duration of neutropenia, we always look at that in terms of the risk for fungal organisms or translocation for gram-negative organisms. Um, we always ask about their travel history and get a sense of the risk for endemic fungal organisms or tuberculosis. Um, you know, infectious disease, people like to ask about these unique exposures like horse breeders and rhodococcus or pigeons and cryptococcus um, or exposure, exposure to soil um, that can predispose to astragalus and nicardia. We ask about their aspiration history, get a sense of their prior um, TB history or any treatment, prior cultures or antibiotics, and of course, <clears throat> the chemotherapy that they've recently received, especially any of them that have known pulmonary toxicity. So the CT scan can be very helpful in pointing you and uh, giving you clues for the likely pathogen. So fo focal or multifocal consolidations will uh, usually put you more thinking about typical bac bacterial infections whereas pulmonary nodules will get you thinking, of course, about um, fungal organisms or, or nicardia. The diffuse ground glass opacities uh, will point you more towards viruses, atypical infections, pneumocystis, or many other non-infectious causes like drug toxicity. Cavitary lesions will make you think about necrotizing infections, which um, have a has a long differential, but um, to me that would increase the probability of fungal or nicardia. And then peripheral lesions that can be um, signs of septic emboli and disseminated infections. This slide on the left showing the classic halo sign. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. Again, the classic sign of aspergillus with pulmonary nodules with 
surrounding ground glass opacities. On the right is the so-called reverse halo sign, and this is something that always worries us when we see this. This is referring to um, ground glass opacity surrounded by a ring or a crescent of um, consolidation, and that suggests angioinvasion that's worrisome for mucormycosis. So, there are non-invasive microbiological evaluations in both immunocompromised and of course, you'll get your urinary antigens based on their availability at your hospital, nasal pharyngeal swabs for respiratory viruses. But then more specific to the immunocompromised cancer patients, now we're thinking about um, the fungal markers like the glucan, galactamanin, the serum crystal cockle antigens, and other tests for things like histoplasma or other endemic uh, fungi based on their um, risk factors, and uh, potentially looking at serum viral PCRs like HSV, VZV, or CMV, particularly in your transplant patients. A word about the galactamin, and we rely on this test quite a bit in this population, and it's, it's a very good test, um, although not perfect. You can see there, these are some estimates of the sensitivity and specificity around 70 and 90 percent. And important to realize that the galactamin has better performance in the heme, hematological population than solid organ transplant. Um, the BAL, um, you can run a, a galactamin off the BAL fluid, and that has higher sensitivity with comparable specificity. And there is cross-reactivity with other fungi, um, particularly penicillium. And of course, with the galactamin, and, um, not only is it useful as a diagnostic test, but also as a prognostic um, marker, as um, the patients are getting um, a downtrend in galactamin, and that is a uh, sign of uh, treatment success. The beta D glucan is a pan fungal marker um, that is elevated with all fungal organisms, uh, with notable exceptions of mucor and cryptococcus. And it's very useful for diagnosing uh, pneumocystis. Uh, you see a patient in the right host with ground glass opacities and a very elevated glucan, you will um, be very worried about pneumocystis. There are many causes for false positives. Um, at our hospital, the, the most common causes are intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG or IV albumin. So whenever I get consulted for a patient with elevated glucan, the first thing I'll look for in their medical record is uh, whether or not they received IVIG or albumin. Uh, and here are some other potential causes of false positives, like the gauze packing in surgical patients, uh, certain dialysis filters, um, some bacterial infections like pseudomonas, and some intravenous antibiotics like augmentin. At our hospital, Brigham Women's, uh, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, this is a BAL pa panel that we typically send. So your routine uh, bacterial cultures, fungal prep and cultures, a pneumocystis DFA, which has low to moderate sensitivity in the cancer patients. Uh, and we well, sometimes we have been sending out for a PCR, which is higher sensitivity, although it does not necessarily distinguish colonization versus active infection. Uh, mycobacterial, modified AFB nocardia, viral respiratory viruses, uh, viral cultures for the herpes viruses and adenovirus, mycoplasma, a BA galactamin, and of course cell counts, differentials, and depending on the setting, um, path and cytology and flow cytometry. And of course, bronchoscopy is useful to evaluate, not only to see what the secretions are like and any, anato any, any anatomic lesions, but uh, to rule out diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Lung biopsy is often considered, um, in particular patients that have suspected fungal infections with negative fungal markers, and basically if all your other tests are negative and the patient's not responding to empiric therapy. Uh, one study from Memorial Sloan Kettering um, looked at their experience um, with biopsies and found that in patients that, um, who underwent the biopsies, uh, they found a diagnosis in about two-thirds of cases, most um, commonly inflammatory or infectious or uh, malignant causes. And the strongest predictor of finding a specific diagnosis was as opposed to a diffuse. Last, last thing I'll talk therapeutic consideration. And so <clears throat> these patients, uh, especially if they're critically ill, generally warrant broad empiric initial therapy covering MRSA and pseudomonas as another grand negative rods, and often with another um, agent to cover um, atypicals, particularly Legionella, so the fluoroquinolones or azithromycin or doxycycline. Of course, during the flu, or Tamiflu, and consider um, coverage for the other uh, opportunistic infections based on the appropriate clinical history and radiographic findings. Antifungal therapy. 
for astragalus, voriconazole, or crisemba, or isobuconazole, your first choices, or mucormycosis, uh, lipotericin, um, liposomal amphotericin is your first line therapy. And as for your opportunistic infections like pneumocystis, Bactrim is first line. And rather than jumping to clindamycin or permaquin, if they're very, very sick, we typically will desensitize them if they're allergic. Uh, Nicardia, Bactrim, plus or minus, imipenemolinazolid, and of course, antivirals for um, the herpes viruses or CMV. I'll just say a word about antibiotic de-escalation and deep duration. Um, of course, when you identify a pathogen, you can tell your regimen and typically, let's say, and drug resistant gram negative uh, within 48 to 72 hours. Um, in terms of duration of therapy, uh, the trend overall has been going shorter and shorter for immunocompetent patients, even as low as five days or perhaps less. But of course, for our immunocompromised patients, we are still um, treating longer, 10 to 14 days uh, for bacterial uh, pneumonia. And procalcitonin is less useful in this population since the cut points of the algorithms have not been validated in these patients. So in summary, pneumonia is a common cause of morbidity and mortality in the patients with cancer who are susceptible not only to your typical bacterial organisms, but also, of course, opportunistic pathogens. Uh, there are many non-infectious mimickers in pneumonia. CT should be obtained early. Uh, we should try our best to obtain a specific microbiologic diagnosis, and that means, um, in addition to non-invasive tests, often getting a bronchoscopy and sometimes even a biopsy. And in the very sick patients, we should be covering very, very broadly, and of course, with specific targeting of opportunistic infections based on the particular history, risk factors, and imaging. Uh, so with that, I will stop, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chanu. And uh, thank you very much. And next, uh, Dr. Mikel Ferret will talk about the non-invasive ventilation immunosuppressed patients. What we have learned during that last year. Thank you. Perfect. Good night, first of all. Uh, and thanks again for giving me the opportunity to participate in this meeting. I am not really in Barcelona, but in a hotel room in Milan because I have another meeting. So I will try to summarize you what we have learned during last year on the use of non-invasive ventilation in immunosuppressed patients. Last year, uh, I presented to you the report of the um, official U.S. ATS uh, clinical practice guidelines on non-invasive ventilation, and I showed you what was the evidence on the use of non-invasive ventilation in these patients. Regarding uh, the need for intubation, which is often the main outcome of the randomized clinical trials, you can see that uh, non-invasive ventilation is associated with a, a slight but significant decrease in the risk of intubation. However, as you can see here, the mass majority of evidence comes from a single large-scale uh, study that uh, found no significant uh, benefits from this uh, super measure. And later on, I will show you more extensive information on this trial. Similarly to uh, intubation, mortality is also slightly reduced with the use of non-invasive ventilation. On all these studies, it was compared with uh, standard ox uh, oxygen therapy as a support for acute respiratory failure. You can see, again, that although the overall uh, effect is positive, the most relevant study sh showed negative results. In summary, the um, grading of the, the evidence of polymonocompromised patients the use of non-invasive ventilation was a considerable, a conditional recommendation with a moderate certainty of evidence because of this heterogeneity of studies. It's important to point out that the main or the most relevant uh, evidence came from all studies published around the, the, the year 2000. In these studies, the control groups had a very poor outcome, and then what uh, the authors found when treating with non-invasive ventilation was a slight, uh, um, uh, cl clear decrease in uh, uh, the, these worse outcomes, but because probably these patients were managed uh, differently than they are managed in the current times. You can see this in this very recent study published three, uh, three years ago. This was a very multicenter French randomized killing and trial, again, in uh, different populations of immunocompromised patients, comparing non-invasive ventilation with standard oxygen therapy as a support. 
you can see, first of all, the study was negative in terms of intubation and in terms of mortality at 28 days. You can see also on the right part of the slide the accumulated incidence of uh, intubation uh, along these 28 days. But you can see here, and this is marked with this line, that the uh, intubation rate of the control group was uh, clearly below 50%, which was uh, nearly 80% in the pre previous studies. And again, the uh, mortality in this control group was around 25-30%, which was also clearly uh, better than in the previous studies. And you can see that with the use of non-invasive ventilation, the authors did not find any significant benefit in them in both uh, major clinical outcomes. Uh, you can see also that the survival and time was uh, nearly uh, the same in the two groups. However, I would like to point out some con uh, consideration. Probably this could be potentially under power study because the uh, expected mortality rate and the expected intubation rate was lower than uh, was expected and then it's more difficult to obtain improvement for a single support measure. You can see that, for example, the median respiratory rate was 25 uh, breaths per minute, the median SOFA was five points, which is not particularly severe in ICU populations. Uh, another consideration is that, that mm, this type of ventilation in these patients with a uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure could be potentially injurious. You can see that um, the authors needed a median tidal volume of nearly 99 ml per kilo of ideal body weight, which is clearly above what is currently recommended in the protective ventilation strategies with a low median level of PIP used in these patients. And finally, that these authors used a very short time on non-invasive ventilation. Along the three initial days, the median time on non-invasive ventilation was 19 hours, which is uh, slightly above six hours per day. And this is difficult to demonstrate the benefit in a measure that is used uh, about uh, one fourth of uh, all the time during the initial days. And there was a high proportion of high flow nasal oxygen therapy in the control group, which is another issue that I'm going to comment in the following slides. Because now the new player in general as a non-invasive strategy for uh, support of respiratory failure in hypoxemic patients is the rise of high flow nasal oxygen therapy. You know very well these devices. These devices uh, consist of a, a gas blender or oxygen blender that may achieve a controlled concentration uh, of oxygen. This gas goes to, into a heater and humidifier and it delivers the patient heated and humidified gas that is uh, delivered in the nasal prongs with a special cannula so that it uh, has a very good um, tolerance for patients. It's very, it's very comfortable. This uh, heated and humidified air uh, improves the mucociliary uh, system to, uh, to remove secretions. It washes, uh, ex exhales CO2, and indeed this decreases the, the the, the dead space. This also uh, this achieves a decrease in the work of breathing and it exerts a slight effect of uh, CPAP or positive pressure ventilation so that you know all these uh, mechanisms help to decrease the work of breathing and improve oxygenation. The, the most striking trial uh, in patients uh, with immunocompromised until very recently, this was a post hoc analysis of a large French randomized uh, multicenter clinical trial. This was the plural study where the authors compared three different uh, modalities, standard oxygen therapy, high flow oxygen, and non-invasive ventilation alternated with high flow, flow. The original trial was published in the 2015 in the New England, but this is the post hoc analysis in the specific populations of immunocompromised patients. You can see that in this study, among the three groups, patients receiving non-invasive ventilation had the highest incidence or the highest probability of intubation and the lowest and the worst survival as compared with the other groups. So it was a very striking um, information that was completely uh, in disagreement with the uh, ERS ATS guidelines. However, I have some considerations again of this study because the studies should be um, read in depth so that we can understand the results. 
uh, the NIP group uh, used the pressure support ventilation, which was adjusted for ex an expired tidal volume of uh, 7 to 10 ml per kilo of ideal or predicted body weight. It resulted with a mean PSV of 8 centimeters water, a very uh, wide variation of initial PIP. And we know uh, from recently that patients with a high uh, drive uh, uh, of the, or high uh, uh, stimulation of the ventilation with uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation, it results in a very high transpulmonary pressure, which indeed uh, results in the, what is re has been recently mm, defined as a patient self-inflicted lung injury that could have been responsible in part for these worse outcomes associated with the use of non-invasive ventilation. Uh, again, the minimal time required for uh, non-invasive ventilation was eight hours a day for at least two days, and indeed, the actual delivery had a median value of eight hours. It means that half of these patients receive eight or less hours of non-invasive ventilation during the day, and uh, in these patients, high flow oxygen therapy was alternated between the non-invasive ventilation sessions. Again, it's difficult to assess uh, an effectiveness of measure that is applied for a such such a long, uh, uh, short period of time. And finally, there was a frequent crossover between groups. For, exa for example, patients on standard oxygen receiving non-invasive ventilation, 28%. Patients with high flow oxygen therapy receiving non-invasive ventilation, 13%. So again, it, uh, this adds to the limitations of a post hoc analysis. However, um, here is what we have learned in the last year, which is the, the, the topic of this session, is a very recent study still online published four weeks ago in the JAMA, a multi center French study, uh, again, that compared high flow oxygen therapy with tan standard oxygen therapy in a population of immunocompromised patients. Now, really a large study, 388 patients in each group. So really, this, uh, this, it was a well-published study. The primary outcome was the 28-day mortality with some secondary outcomes, such as the need for endotracheal intubation by day 28, changes in oxygenation after intubation, respiratory rate, length of stay, ICU acquired infections, comfort, and dizziness. Uh, this study um, had uh, included a very wide variation of patients, but with the predominance of cancer patients, you can see 76 to 82 uh, percent depending on the two group and a lower amount of patients in the other groups <clears throat> and we want, want to show you in the right part this, uh, these patients were really severe at, uh, at admission because the respiratory rate was clearly above 30 breaths per minute and the, uh, um, the, the severity of oxygenation assessed by the PAO2 to a ratio was really uh, low. So these were patients with a very severe acute respiratory failure. However, this is the primary endpoint. This is the mortality along the first 28 days. You can see there absolutely no difference between the two groups. You can see again that the mortalities are around 35% uh, at uh, day 28, which is really better than studies published nearly uh, 20 years ago. And there were no uh, not improvement in any of the secondary outcomes. Just a significantly improvement of the respiratory rate and in the oxygenation with the use of high flow oxygen therapy, but none of the major clinical trials. So this uh, study has been accompanied by a, a very nice uh, editorial that has uh, given some important um, information. For example. We know the high flow oxygen therapy was widely adopted and the popularity was driving because uh, of the early positive studies, uh, improvement in some physiologic and parameters, particularly the severity of uh, oxygenation and a very uh, general ease of application. This is a very attractive and very easy to apply uh, measure. Uh, however, there is often a bit of a zealous enthusiasm for positive results in these preliminary studies uh, however, these are often uh, contradictory subsequently when larger multicenter randomized clinical trials are published. We have seen this before with no in ventilation, and now we can see here with the fly, high flow oxygen therapy. And uh, probably the, the embrace of uh, uh, clinicians, particularly in the critical care uh, environment, could be also likely or at least um, 
also uh, affected by a publication bias is the reluctance to submit the negative results because these results are perceived to be uninteresting. The journal priorities probably for uh, positive and not for negative uh, studies. And also it may depend on the agenda and the funding groups that may also influence the dissemination and this information and they can um, uh, try to limit the publication of this study. So these are my conclusions that unfortunately are not, are not very optimistic. The, the, the original benefits of non-invasive ventilation to improve outcome is in this population of immune superspecies uh, when compared with standard oxygen, which is the, the core standard for these patients, are really not confirmed these, these uh, recent uh, large trials. And in this case, uh, for non-invasive ventilation, there is a very difficult balance between the uh, um, providing patients an adequate ventilator support for the, and avoiding the potentially injurious ventilation, particularly related to the high dra ventilatory drive of these patients and the positive pressure ventilation. This is the patient self-inflicted lung injury. Second is that probably with the current evidence, high flow oxygen therapy is a better non-invasive strategy for these uh, patients. However, again, and as occurred with the non-invasive ventilation, the benefits of high flow oxygen therapy over standard oxygen have not been confirmed in this recent large clinical trial and uh, possibly uh, uh, or a good strategy could be not high flow oxygen or NIF, but alternating both uh, supportive measures in order to improve the efficacy. However, we need additional studies, including probably assessment of uh, other technologies in order to avoid the invasive ventilation because really these measures are clearly needed uh, in uh, the view of these um, disappointing results. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Miquel. Very interesting. And thank you to both of you to adjust your time. Uh, the next speaker, I think no need presentation, is Dr. Ordil. Uh, we talk about the immunosuppression and outcome of ventilator-associated respiratory infection. Good evening, Dr. Ordil. Well, thank you very much um, for the invitation. And um, I don't want to miss the chance to say hello to Bachar. You are very, very far away, but this is your hospital. And, and starting the last 10 minutes of this, um, of this long journey, and 10, 12 minutes, and I try to be um, um, really um, strict with the time. And we're going to speak um, about the impact of immunosuppression on the outcome of ventilator-associated respiratory tract infection. I have no conflict of interest, and about immunocompromised patients, I'm going to focus only in solid cancer patients. <clears throat> so. Um, Immunocompromised status, we know that we have new therapies and, and target therapy that have raised new challenges regarding um, immunocompromised patients and this population that previous and changed the immune defense that previously um, well-defined uh, population. We know that this um, status is heterogeneous. Um, it has multiple causes. Is dynamic. It can change during the ICU um, admission. It can change during the treatment. It can change during the disease, and we have to be aware of that. And there is the changing landscape of malignancies uh, have raised new questions about treatment and outcome in critical ill immunocompromised patients. And these have to be specifically with new molecular diagnosis and therapeutic options. In this review, uh, in this study uh, of the group of Asulai, the, the public this year in intensive care medicine, they look at um, um, the, RDA, the RDS patient admitted to the ICU, um, um, and they classified they dependent on the comorbidities. And they found in the group of patients admitted to the ICU with the Berlin criteria of RDS, more than 50% of those patients has a major um, comorbid condition, and the first one was chronic respiratory disease, and the third one was solid tumors. So, um, and in the multivariate analysis of this same study, they found that um, solid tumors were, was the factor um, independently associated with day 20A mortality. <clears throat> so we know that respiratory involvement of uh, cancer patients are severe, 
and frequent. And we can see also in this study a few years ago from the same group of Azulai, they found that half the patient with cancer admitted to the ICU, they, they came into the ICU because of acute respiratory failure. And the risk of mortality was dependent on the age, the comorbid conditions associated, the, the, stand, um, the goal of treatment, and the need of mechanical ventilation. In that group of patients with RADS coming into the ICU, cancer patients with RADS, 90% were due to infection, and one third of those infections um, were due to microorganisms difficult to treat, like aspergillosis and pneumocystis pneumonia. We can see here that the last 20 years, the blue bars are patients ARDS patient without comorbid condition coming into the ICU, and the, the day 28 mortality is pretty much the same the last 20 years. And But you see the gray bars are a patient with at least one major comorbidity, and the tendency is de um, decreased the, the day 28 mortality. It's not significant, but significant, but um, is decreasing. So we know that cancer patients with ARDS have a particular poor outcome in the ICU. Um, as we can see here in this graphic from Soboni, um, cancer patients has um, worse outcome than non-cancer patients um, admitted in the ICU. But the outcome in cancer patients with ARDS admitted to the ICU is much better than reported uh, a few years ago. And we can see here that almost 50% of the cancer patients, they were alive at the day 28 in the ICU. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in, this, in this study of Tacone, uh, pretty much um, the same year, um, when you see the difference between cancer patient and solid, uh, no cancer patient and solid cancer patient, they were not much different. And, and the pronostic factor associated were related pretty much with lung involvement, acute uh, lung injury, acute respiratory distress syndrome, need of mechanical ventilation and sepsis that probably is related with the other two uh, factors. So 20 years, um, we can see that hospital mortality is coming down, uh, it's still high. Immunocompromised patients in the ICU have poor outcome, yes, but it's, it's, going, it's getting better. And when we dive a little bit deeper in what difference are between cancer and not cancer patient, we find sometimes in studies that only cho shows the age and um, the severity of the disease um, as the most important difference. And <clears throat> in this study of the group of uh, Sapsir and, um, and Sophie Moreau, they published this year the impact of immunosuppression in ventilator associated low respiratory tract infection, and they found that patients with um, immunosuppression, they have lower um, ventilator associated, lower respiratory tract infection in any of those forms, uh, tracheobronchitis or pneumonia. But if they got an infection, they have higher mortality, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, and longer stay in the ICU. And also immunosuppression was um, a pronostic factor, um, independent factor associated with mortality. <clears throat> It's important to remember that this, um, there are few information in the literature about the type of cancer and outcome and uh, a stage of the cancer and outcome. And um, we try to do that here in our hospital and look at cancer patient um, admitted to the ICU after a major abdominal, abdominal surgery. And we didn't find any different in outcome depending mm -hmm. the type of cancer previous treatment received and more, more especially in the stage um, of the disease. So there are potential explanations for worse outcome in this group of patients. We know that cancer patient has more severe infection condition. They probably receive more antibiotic before coming to the ICU, and probably they have they are at more risk of having multi drug resistant microorganism or difficult to treat organism like fungal or viral infection. We know also that they can develop acute lung injury to, related to chemotherapy agents or radiation. Um, there could be a delay in diagnosis because it's not um, the regular presentation of sputum, fever, and um, pneumonic infiltration in the x-ray. The age probably is, is uh, the older. Um, also, the line of chemotherapy, uh, the more line of chemotherapy, the worse outcome in this group of patients. The time between respiratory symptoms and the ICU admission, that is a delay in the ICU admission, is related to mortality in this group of patients. And of course, 
extra respiratory symptoms, that means that the severity of the disease uh, is also related with worse outcome in this group of patients. <clears throat> Sometimes the only thing that is associated with, uh, the only thing different between the two group of patients um, with cancer is um, the performance status previous to the uh, ICU um, admission. But we have to keep in mind that the last 20 years, and I insist in this, um, there, are, there is an improvement in survival and critical ill patients with cancer. ICU survival, hospital survival, and one year survival. I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but there are, um, this is um, the ABCD management rule for critical ill cancer patient, and <clears throat> there are things about admission that are important to remember. Do not decline ICU admission based on outdated prognostic factors. We have to evaluate patients and take decisions day to day with the help of oncologists and hematologists. Deliver them standard of care as a regular other ICU patient and be aware of false belief that um, I want to go in a little bit more detail in this one because um, there are changes in what we pre previously um, thought about cancer patient in the ICU. It is wrong to state that cancer related characteristics like cancer type um, neutropenia are the main prognostic factor among pre-acute illness condition. It is wrong, um, as my previous speaker said, that to state the non-invasive ventilator support strategy should be the rule in patients with acute respiratory failure as they, uh, as they improve survival. This is very important. Number five, it is wrong to state that our ability to identify patients likely to benefit from ICU admission or not is optimal. and. Um, finally, I just mm, want to um, remark also that it's wrong to state that intensivists and oncohematology should plan care separately to avoid conflict. So um, I'm not going to go through all the, the, ten, one, the, the ten rules, but um, um, the slides are available for, um, for anyone that is interested. So to finish, I want to, to show you this case we have here a few months ago, a, a male 68 years old uh, from Equatorial mm -hmm. Guinea, came directly from the emergency department, direct from the airport with very severe acute respiratory failure and he needed urgently intubation and mechanical ventilation. This was the, um, the bronchoscopy that we did. There was a huge tumor um, sitting in the carina and you can see a little bit uh, the, um, there was almost no room for air entry to the to the right um, main bronchi, and and a few days after uh, two pills, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, with alertinib, this was the bronchoscopy of the same patient. So um, there is a change in landscape of malignancy and ICU admission, and we have to be aware of that. And my take-home messages are this: in cancer patient, the main cause of admission in the ICU is acute respiratory failure. 36% of those cases are ARDS. Half of those patients with ARDS have major comorbidities and this proportion is increasing and also is decreasing, not significantly decreasing um, the mortality in this group of patients. Recent studies suggest improvement in the outcome of critical ill patients, including those with ARDS require mechanical ventilation we have to be aware of false belief regarding critical ill cancer patient, and ICU admission should not be denied on basis of a patient having a neoplastic disease. Uh, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Will. Uh, fantastic presentation. And now we'll go to present Dr. Marcela Gonzalez del Vecchio and Dr. Rosa Reina. Uh, to start a short time for answers and questions, and perhaps to clarify our doubts by these magnificent three doctors. Please. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you for in inviting me to participate in this very interesting um, session. So my first question would be for um, Dr. Rhee. Um, uh, you know, just how cancer patients, the, the immunology is very important, especially now with the new immunotherapies. And um, so what, what do you, um, in your hospital, do you use any um, sort of immunological markers um, for these patients to, to maybe guide treatment strategies, for example, on um, prophylaxis um, for fungal infections or CMV? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I think uh, there's um, you know, the field of uh, immunotherapy is rapidly evolving. So, you know, I would say that uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we have with that is um, oftentimes these patients will develop pulmonary toxicities or pulmonary symptoms, and trying to distinguish that from infection is, is often the hardest thing. Uh, we will track inflammatory markers. We will track procalcitonin, but as you probably know, none of those are perfect in distinguishing uh, kind of the you know inflammatory effects versus infection. So practically speaking, uh, we will um, be very aggressive with our usual diagnostic workup, often with bronchoscopies and all our usual non-invasive tests. We'll often treat empirically, and the question will often come up whether you know to uh, give um, you know steroids or in the case of um, patients um, with a CAR T cell uh, toxicity, for example given tocilizumab, and so that's often the question that we, uh, the conundrum that we face, and um, usually, you know, after we've ruled out infections, we'll often keep them empirically treated with antibiotics, but give the go-ahead for the oncologist to, to try to um, give those type of drugs, steroids, or tocilizumab to tamp down um, potential side effects from the immunotherapy. to ask uh, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Baez Pradia um, in related to the, according to the, the last evidence about uh, non-invasive ventilation or, or uh, high flow nasal oxygen versus standard oxygenation, uh, should we to uh, come back to uh, try to intubate this patient and not don't, and don't delay the uh, uh, syndotracheal intubation uh, according to this last uh, information or this last evidence, just to not uh, delay the intubation and the consequences of the, um, uh, the, the, the delay about the endotracheal intubation. I, I would like to know about your opinion about this. Yes, uh, this is a very uh, good question. I think that we should uh, not change uh, dramatically our criteria for intubate these patients. I think the, the, the decision to intubate are really clear, and uh, intubation is always a sort of uh, failure of the previous measure to support the respiratory failure. Uh, we have uh, very good evidences. I did not treat in this uh, topic because of the time constraints that in patients with uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure, with, or if you will, uh, non de novo respiratory failure, delaying intubation is uh, mm, uh, constantly related with increased uh, mortality compared to more early intubation in these patients. However, you have always to balance between uh, the, the risk to precipitate intubation and probably intubate patients who, at the end, would not need this, uh, this uh, measure, or to uh, delay this intubation and to uh, put these patients at increased risk of mortality. What I think that the studies uh, show us, at least the recent studies, is that we have improved dramatically the management of these uh, monosuppressed patients because uh, now it depends on the early diagnosis, more support therapies, immunotherapy, better antimicrobials, many, many measures that I think my previous, the previous speaker has uh, commented extensively. And probably with this improved uh, uh, management of patients, now the, uh, the non-invasive support measures are less relevant compared to studies published nearly 20 years ago when uh, the, the management was very poor. And in, the, in that case, probably non-invasive intervention marked a difference. I think that we have to continue supporting these patients because um, what uh, these studies uh, don't show is that high flow of therapy, at least how what flow of therapy is not deleterious, but what we uh, know in this study is that the benefits are less clear and probably we need to search for other type of technologies or other uh, management of this uh, respiratory failure in this patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? Um, I'd like to have uh, ask a question for Dr. Baez, um, because 
you've shown that um, interesting data on how um, the outcome of um, cancer patients is clearly worse um, in the ICU, but then also how the mortality is decreasing. So I guess also with Dr. Ferrer's um, answer right now, why do you think that is? If they have a worse outcome, how come the mortality is actually decreasing um, in these patients? Well, I, I think um, mortality in ICU patients with RADS are um, are together with the um, cancer patient. I mean, the last 20 years, we have learned a lot about mechanical ventilation. Um, we have uh, we have used uh, moderate um, uh, volume tidal ventilation, and and in, and the mortality in, in RDS patient in the general RDS patient is is getting better in the last 20 years. So probably cancer patient are are the mortality in this group of patients is um, reflecting better care of the intensive care in the general population. Because uh, when you see that data of what the difference are between cancer patient and non-cancer patient, probably the age, the severity of the disease, um, comorbid conditions, yes, but they are more severe, severe group of patients. But I think what we are looking now, um, uh, the decrease in the mortality in this group um, goes together, I don't know if I'm explaining myself, it goes together with the better care that we do in intensive care. ARDS were very restrict now with the, the fluid um, and the volume tidal, and so all those measures measures at the end reflects also uh, a better care for cancer patient in the ICU and a better outcome for cancer patient in the ICU. Okay, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Reed about the antibiotic treatment for this uh, Critical patients, um, the, the way the doses and the way of administration of antibiotics, do you think that it could make the difference? I mean, uh, giving them in infusion, in continuous infusion or extended infusion uh, versus intermittent infusion in this uh, very uh, compromised patient, the, the, this different way of administration of antibiotics could make some difference in the evolution uh, of these patients? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's, it's a good one. Um, <clears throat> I think, so the question about the continuous infusions, I will say we don't, we don't routinely do it for all of our patients empirically. Um, we typically will reserve that for, if we do isolate um, a gram negative where, um, you know, it does have a resistant pattern or perhaps the MIC of the organism is is borderline. So I, I know some hospitals, the evidence, um, there are multiple studies out there, as you probably know, and um, some of them certainly do support um, the continuous infusions uh, with the idea of achieving higher, um, you know, concentration time, time above the um, above the MIC. So uh, again, at least at our institution, we, we don't routinely do it for all of our critical ill patients, but we will do it from time to time uh, if we do isolate a specific gram-negative organisms. Um, and particularly if the uh, particularly the uh, MIC is borderline. Thanks. Yes. Do you have? Thank you very much. Do you have any more questions? Mm -hmm. okay. Not for me. Thank you. No. I just uh, would like to. To ask, it's a global question. It's not a thing. As we know, uh, the lung is, is the target. This one of my friends told me, and we all know. And all the physician, all the physician minds, when the patient is having a, a bad outcome, appears the word steroids. Uh, what's your opinion in in those patients, in immunosuppressed patient? Uh, early stage or late stage in the treatment is better to, to use steroids or if we have indication or indication what do you think well um th there are there are some some uh causes or causes of uh, former infiltrates and respiratory failure that may respond to, to steroids you know basically with organizing pneumonia 
as a support for pneumocystis gyrobeci pneumonia uh, and very few indications. Probably um, what, what is a very frequent practice, as you have commented, is that when you have no improvement in uh, uh, pulmonary opacities, uh, respiratory does not improve, it is going worse. And you cannot uh, demonstrate an active infection, infection that is not uh, appropriately treated with antimicrobials, then uh, corticoideroids is often uh, used as the final rescue therapy, sometimes with uh, efficacy, sometimes without this. But actually, there are uh, a lot of causes of um, respiratory failure and pulmonary infiltrates that are not uh, diagnosed in the clinical practice, and probably some of these may uh, respond favorably to corticosteroids, but not as a general rule, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just one minute. I have time at the beginning to give thanks to, to all the organizers for doing that symposium possible and connecting practice with all the continents uh, with a single purpose, science. Of course, thank you all the opportunity to collaborate and modify uh, this last uh, 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 say, uh, section dedicated to the clinical lung in the immunosuppressed patients. Thank you, Dr. Pablo, for your effort and dedication, and uh, have a good uh, hug from United Arab Emirates, and I hope to see you soon, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Estimados colegas, hace un año se realizó la primera edición del Día Mundial del Pulmón, que tuvieron mucho éxito donde más de 2.500 profesionales se incorporaron a esa sesión de que duraron 24 horas. Y luego de un año, el comité organizador formado por los doctores Pablo Cardinal, Luis Blanche, Carmelo Dueñas, Guillermo Mortiz, Orville Baez y Manuel Gibaja, han, se han constituido para organizar este segundo evento que se hará el día 21 de noviembre. Quiero agradecerle al comité organizador y a todos los oradores que van a estar presentes el día 21 de noviembre, y asimismo destacar lo inclusivo que se han, han sido para poder realizar este evento. Asimismo, quiero agradecer a las empresas que han esponsoreado el Día Mundial del Pulmón. Gracias por estar presente y éxitos en la nueva edición.
Do more. Feel better. <laughs> Live longer. At GSK, we have a very special purpose, but we live in a challenging and uncertain world where even more is expected of us. We're on the brink of a seismic shift in the world's age population. Troubling news over rising costs and their impact on patients. Our opportunity has never been greater. Science and technology is rapidly transforming our understanding of disease. And there is ever more demand for innovation. To become one of the world's most innovative, best performing and trusted healthcare companies, we must respond. So let's take on this unique challenge together to change the world for the better. By having the courage to push the boundaries of research. Harnessing our breakthrough science. To bring needed quality healthcare products to more people. Partnering with those who share our values to go even further. And most importantly, being in touch with society so people trust both our science and our intentions. Together, let's challenge ourselves today to change people's lives tomorrow.